Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're just going to give people a minute to um, to come in. I'm seeing people trickle in. Just takes a second. And Hillary, are you seeing the presentation in the right mode, or is it in presenter mode? Um, I am seeing the I'm seeing presenter mode, but I see the slides going along the bottom. As okay. Well. Yeah, that's not what we want. How about that? Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, as Hillary said, uh, this is Eric Shell. We're just going to give people a minute or two to to jump in, and then we're going to go ahead and get kicked off here. So again, people are just trickling in now. Uh, good morning to some, good afternoon to others, and um, we're going to give it another minute, and then we're gonna we're gonna launch into the pre the presentation. So. All right, we're going to start it two minutes after the hour. <laughs> Just in case everybody was waiting. And there we go. So, so uh, you know, again, uh, good afternoon to some, good morning to others. Um, this is Eric Schell, uh, chairman with Strawwater Associates. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the third annual Stroudwater Virtual Financial and Operational um, conference. Um, it's a two day, um, um, uh, two hours each day, um, today and tomorrow. And, um, and, and, and so uh, anyway, we're going to, we're going to get kicked off. I'm doing the introduction because I have the first presentation um, of, 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 of the day lined up. So with that, uh, just some basic housekeeping. Uh, um, first, uh, participants, uh, you will be muted if you want to ask a question or you want to make a comment or you want to yell at this presenter, um, do so into the chat, bo chat box and, and then um, Hillary will let me know, um, um, you know, kind of where are the questions and we can get those answered. All sessions are recorded and will be available um, and, and the slides will also be made available. And then, and then there will be following, following uh, this session, there'll be a, a short uh, a survey looking for your feedback. So, so just real briefly, um, you know, two quick slides on, on Stroudwater. Um, we consider ourselves a, a preeminent rural healthcare consulting firm um, with, with um, services primarily in strategy, finance, ops. It's going to be a lot of discussion today. Physician services, um, um, uh, facility options. Um, revenue cycle, clinical services, et cetera. And this is just a map showing of, of the different places that we get to travel to. Um, and this is just since 2017. So um, um, anyway, lots of, lots of travel. Um, we've also have a um, uh, affiliate, Stroudwater Capital Partners. For the many of you know, my colleague, Brian Hoppola, um, um, he's heading up our Stroudwater Capital Partners. And you can see the 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 different types of, of client work that this has been going on now since they were launched uh, just over three years ago. So um, again, welcome, and and we're going to jump right into my presentation because we've got uh, 22 slides and and not a lot of time to get there. Uh, so so you know, as I travel around the country, I continually have people ask me, uh, you know, Eric, if you were to distill down. You know, best practices. What are the top three, you know, key 
aspects of rural hospital success. And it took me a while to think about what those are. And I've, I've been traveling for 26 years. Um, um, with Stroudwater, probably visited 300 to 350 rural hospitals. And, and as I started to think through what are those keys to the kingdom in terms of financial and operational success, um, it really, and I'll tip my hand right here on this overview slide, but, but, but it's these first three. It's, it's the abundance mindset. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that on the next slide a fundamental understanding of economics and what drives improved financial performance and a measurement culture. And these three, I consider the most important aspects of success for financial and operational success. And I'm gonna back that up with some case studies. We have five case studies of, of rural hospitals that I've had the chance to see um, that, that have you know, kind of you know, really um, um, epitomized uh, these 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 three um, um, attributes of successful rural hospitals, and and so that's where we're going today. These are the three, and now we're just going to talk a little about what they mean. Um, I, I always like to start off with a, a sense of both. These are my individual values: impact, interdependence, respect, and abundance. And frankly, these are the values that our firm, Stroudwater Associates, has adopted. But it really, the circle is around this abundance mindset. Um, and, and what I would like to do is, if, if you allow me, well, um, is, is to just read from uh, you know, a, a, a one page from Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, kind of originally published 34 years ago. But he coined this, this, this abundance mentality in, in comparison to a scarcity mentality. And, and let, me, let me just read from you a little bit about what these mean, because they are very meaningful to me. Um, and they are I, what I consider the number one key to success. So he talks about most people are deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. And this is the opposite of abundance. They see life as having only so much as though there was only one pie out there. And if someone were to get a big piece of the pie, it would mean less for everybody else, and primarily for me. This, uh, people with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing recognition and credit, power or profit, even with those who help in the production. They also have a very hard time being, um, um, being genuinely happy for the successes of other people. It's almost as if something is being taken from them when someone else receives special recognition or windfall gain or has remarkable success. Although they might verbally express happiness for others, success inwardly, they eating, they're, they're eating their hearts out. Their sense of worth comes from being compared. And someone else's success to some degree means their failure. Only so many people can be A students. Only one person can be number one. To, sim, to win simply means to be. Um, often people with scarcity mentality harbor secret hopes that others might suffer misfortune. Not terrible misfortune, but acceptable misfortune that would keep them in their place. Uh, they want people to be they want the way they want them to be. They often want to clone them, and they surround themselves with yes people, people who won't challenge them, people who are weaker than they are. Um, that is all about scarcity. And then he turns around and in one paragraph says, and here's what's abundance. He said, the abundance mentality, on the other hand, flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth and security. It is the paradigm that there's plenty out there and enough to spare for everybody. It results in sharing of prestige, of recognition, of profits, of decision-making. It opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. The abundance mindset as I've traveled, um, first of all, it's, it's rare. You, it's probably 80% of the time within rural hospitals you don't see abundance um, at, at the top of the leadership. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is that generally uh, scarcity people uh, are based, are really looking out for themselves where abundance are looking out for, 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 for all others. And so the abundance has a wide open back exposed. And so in, in what's really interesting is each of the five case studies uh, that I will present, well, four of the five case studies uh, these abundance leaders were taken out at some point in their career, and then many, most reinstituted, uh, re, you know, brought back into the organization. 
So first, keys to the kingdom, an abundance mindset. The second is a fundamental understanding of economics and what drives profit. Um, that profit-making vehicle for rural hospitals is contribution margin. Uh, contribution margin is a formula that says what's revenue, incremental revenue, versus the variable expense of performing that incremental revenue. The difference there is contribution margin. And a hospital is made up of thousands and thousands and thousands of mini contribution margins, all set up to cover the fact, fixed or step fixed cost within an organization. And, and, um, and, and what's, what's really challenging about this is that depend, the, 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 our, our accounting systems are not going to tell us what variable costs are because there's a time component associated with variable costs. And let me explain. If you're making a spot market decision, do we admit a patient into our hospital tonight or do we, uh, do we transfer? The incremental costs of that one more patient day are pennies on the dollar. It's food, it's pharmaceuticals, um, you know, electricity to turn on, the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the additional electricity to turn the light on in the patient room. It's not a lot. And that's a spot market. Over a longer term planning horizon, for example, five years, 100% of variable costs, our, our costs are variable because you can just close the institution. And in the median term, say six month or 12 months planning horizon, now costs, variable costs become costs, including staffing and others. And so while contribution margin, i.e. revenue less variable expenses is the keys to the kingdom, are the key is the keys to the kingdom, it's really tough to calculate because our accounting systems won't allow us to come up with variable expenses. And so, you know, kind of what does this look like from a hospital cost structure? You know, I always like to start off with this, this line that I'm highlighting right here is your cost curve, right? That, that you know, kind of high fixed costs, right? Think of your, your, part, your patient parking lot in the morning versus your employee parking lot. That's high fixed costs. Uh, and then for each incremental increase in volume, as you push off uh, on volumes along the X curve, your costs go up a tiny bit so that your total costs increase, but on a very shallow sloped line. On the other hand, revenue goes up much more steeply. Uh, you, you admit somebody today, you get $2,500. Uh, you know, $2, Our variable cost might be $250. Um, we have someone in the emergency room. Our variable cost might, or our revenue, our revenue may be $1,000. Our costs, our incremental costs of one more emergency room visit are, is tiny, you know, 50 bucks. And so what happens, as long as you can push out volumes far enough, the steep sloped revenue line will catch up to the shallow slope cost line to the point where you can create profit. And, 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 you know, several years ago, I ended up creating an Excel spreadsheet to kind of highlight, um, you know, kind of this phenomena. And, and just, just let, you know, let me just set the stage with a couple of assumptions. So fixed costs for this inpatient unit, it's a small inpatient unit, are $6 million. It's a hypothetical. Uh, the variable cost on a swing bed day is 150. The variable cost on an acute very, uh, um, a day is $250. So as census grows, and the, what I've modeled out is a census growing from four to nine, our fixed costs remain fixed. Our variable costs go up, but only a little bit. And so almost back to that chart we just looked at, our cost curve goes up as volume increases, but it, at a very low rate of growth. What happens from a unit cost perspective is is as volume goes up, your variable costs per patient day stay exactly the same. It's either the $250 for the acute, $150 for the swing bed. But our total costs come down because that $6 million of variable costs, or excuse me, of fixed costs gets diluted over more and more units of service. And, and so this, this graph, this, this graph right here, is essentially shows if you're going to be successful as a critical access hospital, this highlights the three ways in which we become we can become more successful. Let me explain it to you first. The blue, this is your non-cost-based revenue per day. Think of it as 
self-pay or Medicaid, or if you're not cost-based Medicaid, or Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Healthcare, if, if United Healthcare is paying that day. Um, and, and so it's it's a flat number. It's a, it's a flat amount, which just assumed in this case at $1,400 a day. Um, the, the pink line is your total cost per day, right? As volume is pushed up, you're diluting fixed costs over more units of service, which drives down unit cost. And then the red line is your cost-based revenue, your Medicare, or in some cases, Medicare and Medicaid revenue per day. And it's tied to your costs. So you can't make any money there, but what this chart shows you is that there's a couple ways to make money as a critical access hospital. The first is to push out volume. If we recognize that the break even for this inpatient unit is a census of around 7.25, that's the break even point. The key is to use volume, both Medicare and other volume, to put our costs in a position where we can be profitable. And that position is below where the third party payers are willing to pay. So number one is volume. The second thing we can do is renegotiate with third-party payers. Many rural hospitals that I visit, they haven't looked at their third-party contracts in years. Um, and it's something that should be top priority because it's strategy number two, able to increase this, this, um, um, this you know, in, you know, in, you know, increase this, this, this curve of um, all other revenue per day. And the last is to cut expenses. But I promise you, that's one that so many rural hospitals have, have has cut expenses and so much they've cut into the bone. So coming back to that understanding of economics, a key driver is volume growth. And that just happens to correlate perfectly with an abundance mindset that is all about growth. So, you know, what are some of the areas that we want to look at from this efficiency is this first one, appropriate patient volumes. Revenue cycles operating with best practices, you know, getting paid, getting that revenue curve up a little bit, um, expenses managed aggressively, physician practices, all of these are going to be the keys to the kingdom. What are some specific approaches around growing volume? And, and um, uh, I use an analogy often when I'm talking to rural hospitals um, of, 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 you know, if a baseball analogy. Um, we have department managers who are catchers. And we have department managers who are pitchers. The department managers who are catchers sit behind their office. The ball comes in. It's a wild pitch. And they'll point at the pitcher and say it's their fault. And what happens in these departments primarily is that there's not a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, they, they don't feel like they can control their revenue streams or their volume. And, and again, we'll point to others to, to place blame for non-growth. The pitchers, on the other hand, and I think if every single one of you close your eyes and think for a second around who's the pitcher in my hospital, the pitcher department manager, you have one. And it's that one manager who's out there, you know, on Facebook promoting, hey, we're all open at lunchtime, come see me, or they're at the ball games, or they're, you know, leading the 5K races in town. And um, they're always out there and they're always trying to drum up business and their volumes are generally going up. Um, so, so, you know, uh, what I'd like to think is how can we um, think, you know, create more managers, you, you know, really, really highlight these pitchers and get more catchers to think more like pitchers. Some of the opportunities that we see ER admissions, if we're not at 10 to 12% ER admission rate, uh, we have an opportunity. That's generally the target we shoot for. Swing bed is one of those services that as soon as you uh, kind of shine a, a strategic highlight or spotlight on, you see improvement. As soon as you take that strategic emphasis off of swing bed services, they shrink back back down. Um, so you know clearly something, you know, the pitchers out there can grow swing bed services. And then other ancillary services, tracking referrals by provider, you know, targeting growth, recapturing lost market share, all opportunities around growing volume with this abundance mindset. Um, I'm going to start to lean into the third, which is the, the measurement system. Um, revenue cycles. Um, I, I like to see revenue cycles, you know, that, that operate better. You know, the top performing revenue cycles, they do two things really well. They have a measurement culture. They measure, they have a set of key performance indicators. They set targets. Um, they, they drive their weekly revenue cycle teams, you know, trying to address variance from actual to target. 
Um, and then they supercharge the front end. And, and so with that as a lead in, the third keys to the kingdom I think about is measurement and, and having a measurement culture within our organizations. So, so this comes out of kind of organizational design theory. Organizational design theory says, uh, you know, kind of it's a three-legged stool of where do we set decision rights within an organization is number one. How do we measure performance, both providing information to frontline workers to make better decisions and measurement information that the leader, the senior leadership can, you know, see, you know, the results of the others under them. And the third leg of the stool is compensation. The theory says that increasingly, especially in our complex healthcare organizations, we're going to want to push decision making down to frontline work staff and managers where they have site specific information that they can leverage for the benefit of the organization. So in, in, if we want to go ahead and push decision rights down, then we need to do two things. We need to amp up the measurement systems. We have to provide those entrepreneurial managers with good information to make decisions and to judge their decisions. And then again, we need information at the top level to make sure that they're you know, doing a great job. The third leg of the stool says that if you're gonna push decision rights down, if we're going to have this more effective management system provided to our entrepreneurs, then we have to recognize compensation with you know, more merit-based pay. And, and so the circle here is around measurement because we think that measurement and the hospitals uh, you know, I was on a call yesterday with a hospital in the up, uh, kind of out, out in Region E, um, where they just have an incredible measurement culture, and um, we talked about the importance of that. And I'll show you a result. They're one of my case studies, so we're going to show you that that one. But but having that sophisticated measurement culture is great. So where are some of the areas that that we've seen have the most effective use of of measure, uh, measurement culture? The first is management accounting, engaging managers first in the budget press process, not just on the expense side, because gosh, you know, 85% of our costs and our budgets are fixed anyway. Um, but yeah, you want to have your managers provide input in the budget process on expenses, but volume is the more important, you know, volume is 100% variable. Um, and, and so what we want to think about is engaging those managers especially our ancillary department, our revenue producing departments in that budget process, first and foremost. We then want to provide monthly financial information, budget to actual with required variance analysis. And I would even go as far as recommend quarterly departmental operational reviews where you know, the clinical managers can meet with the CEO and CFO on a quarterly basis to, to understand the business. One, so that the senior leadership can educate the managers on the finance function, but also so that the finance or the clinical function can educate senior leadership on what's going on in the departments. So management accounting, this is one that if you're not doing this well, you know, circle it. This is super important. Staffing efficiencies. We like to look at rural benchmarks. You know, let me just show you what we look at. We have a set of kind of rural standards, and this is paid hourly basis. It's not worked. It's paid. Uh, for example, nursing, med surge, a probation day. Um, this is an example of the hospital. We look at 12 paid hours per patient day as a standard. And this patient day includes swing bed, observation, acute. Um, and in this case, the hospital would expect to have somewhere around 26 FTEs at standard. They have 34. So they've got some room. They've got some room to grow. And, and that's the way we like to think about it, that you can, at, at the current staffing level, you have room to grow services. And for each one of these departments, you know, emergency rooms, another one, we like to think 2.75 paid hours is, is, is the, the target for um, emergency room um, um, visits on a paid hour basis. And you can go down and see which each of the metrics are. Um, in the example here in this case, the hourly standards in this column that I'm highlighting, and then in this case, it's just a calculation of difference between standard and actual. Another is, is physician need. Um, you know, given a population of 24,000, there's been studies that have been published over the last 20 years that saying, given a population of 24,000, what's the demand for medical staff? Um, you know, this Behind this uh, spreadsheet right here is, is 
three studies. This, the first column presents the low end of the study. The second column presents the high of the range of the study. And this just shows you the range. So what this is saying is that this hospital could support somewhere between 16 and 21 primary care FTEs. They're at 11.55. They're short. So it's very likely that people are leaving the community for um, primary care ser services. Uh, not a good place to be in. Other areas, uh, quality. You know, having a measurement culture around quality, organizational KPIs. You know, all of these are opportunities for to shine the light on on you know with measurement on organizational performance. Um, in the last five minutes, I just I just have a couple of case studies, and 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 frankly, every single one of the CEOs here in these examples are, are I would consider them good friends of mine. And, and, and this is a hospital in the Northeast. You know, it's kind of somewhat outside of your region, but um, this is just an example of the green line is operating revenue. And this goes back to so 2012 to 2016. Uh, funny, I just had a, a call with uh, the CEO of this hospital on, on um, last Thursday. And they're looking at around a 15% operating margin for 2023. They're on track, yeah, for a 15% operating margin. So the performance that he gained is continuing to improve. This is expenses. And again, you know, recognizing as, as revenue goes up that, that, that expenses have to, you have to staff up to meet. And then the blue line tied to the Z axis is operating margin. And even though it dropped back a little in 2016, still well above zero, which is fantastic for a critical acts hospital. He is the, this gentleman is the picture of abundance. Uh, whenever you talk to him, you leave a conversation feeling better about yourself. Um, um, he engaged the medical staff, you know, clearly improved their, 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 um, their attitude towards the hospital. And then, you know, with measurement, they are the top quality uh, rural, uh, their top quality hospital in the state that they're in and all through significant measurement function around quality. The next is, uh, this was a critical acts hospital in the upper Midwest, uh, former CFO turned CEO, very abundance focused. When we had got there, they had just replaced their critical access hospital. Um, great relationship with the medical staff, was engaging all staff. Again, the green line, um, is revenue, and the revenue really started to separate from operating expense, the red line, and you can just see the operating margin. And I just have a couple, you know, the quality here, uh, top quality score within uh, within probably 50 miles. Um, they had um, um, a measurement culture around quality. They had uh, the engaged uh, Studer group and, and implemented the, um, the, the LEMS for each of their leadership team in which each of their leaders had defined um, objectives that they were measured against. Um, you know, 10 goals in place for department managers and leadership. Quality scores presented to the board annually and LEM goals are presented monthly. The department managers were involved in the operational and financial management through budget preparation, both revenue and expense. Each manager had four to six goals as part of the LEM process, you know, really driving accountability uh, in, in performance with measurement. Um, the next is, this is a, uh, another critical acts hospital in, in um, the, the, this was a new CEO came in here. You can see that the, the green line is operating margin. The, um, the blue line is revenue. For the first several years, revenue was below expenses, which is common in what we see until fiscal year 2022, when they went significantly above. Now, obviously the COVID uh, impacted 20 and 21, but what you saw is new CEO, this was, this was this operating margin came down to about 10 points, negative 10.6, new CEO came in, uptick, uptick as revenue grew, and then the COVID hit, <laughs> but then uh, coming out of COVID, a stronger organization, but another got picture, picture of, of abundance. Um, the relationship with the medical staff was, is, is so incredibly strong right now. I was at a board retreat to his, uh, this organization back in February. The medical staff is just so proud of the organization. Um, managers are held accountable with, with budgets to actual. Uh, this this was this was a hospital. Interestingly enough, 
that, that was being literally driven into the ground. Here's expenses, here's revenue. They had a negative 9.1% operating margin. This is, in the, this is in the Southeast part of the United States. Um, the leadership team at the time pretty much convinced the board that there's you know, nothing else we can do. The, the hospital's gonna lose money, bad pay, payer rates, uh, third-party contracts are not good. And they replaced that management team with the, um, the head of the foundation of this organization. And as soon as they did that, this, this, this woman just led a significant growth in, in revenue, where all of a sudden revenue jumped $14 million in one year. They, they, they created a partnership with an orthopedic group. They, bought in, they brought in a Da Vinci uh, robot, and you can see that the revenue has jumped and has now stayed above. And this was coming right through COVID without any of the COVID funds reflected in operating revenue. Very abundance leader, measurement culture. And the last is, is a, 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 a critical access hospital up in your neck of the woods. I was actually on a call with them yesterday. Um, I would again put the, the 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 CEO's picture alongside the dictionary of the word abundance. Absolutely growth growth focused. Um, a focus on community health, where they want to have their community be a blue zone within ten years. Uh, they um, they built a, a three story wellness center in the parking lot of the hospital to say, hey, we want to be both about providing best access to sick care, but also we want to start thinking now about what healthcare is going to look like and really commit to health in our community. Um, which the, the 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 let me just show you quickly. The blue line is revenue, and you can see revenue really took off in 21 and 22, and expenses have stayed way way below to the point where the hospital's operating margin at 15% in 2021, again, excluding COVID funds, fell back a little in 22 because of the huge escalation in costs and especially staffing costs, but still at 8.1% is extraordinary performance for a, rural, for a rural hospital. Significant investment in primary care, committed to community wellness, absolute abundance. And so, you know, I'd like to wrap this up by just saying that, um, you know, I, I, I think these, these, this abundance mindset, this fundamental understanding of economics and organizational design that promotes accountability through measurement, the three keys to the kingdom. Um, so, so with that, I went over a little bit and uh, the next speaker is, is, um, <laughs> is, 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 is Opal Greenway. Uh, my colleague and, and principal and a, a fellow director at Stroudwater. First of all, is there, do we have any questions at all? I don't see anything showing up in the chat box. I'm not seeing anything, Eric, but um, if anyone has any final questions for Eric, you could put them into the, to the Q&A or the chat. Um, and if he can't address your questions online, um, you can always reach out to him. Or, or if you can't do it live, you can always reach out to him online. Absolutely. Uh, many of you know me, so please do reach out. With that, I'm going to introduce Opal Greenway. Opal is our expert in the firm around physician practice management, physician contracting strategies. Uh, unfortunately, she went to the University of Alabama, but we can't all hold that against her. And um, But with that, I'd love to hear what Opal's got to say to us. So appreciate you guys all listening this morning and this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, Eric, and great presentation on that abundance mindset and how it can impact a hospital. So, well, I'm going to talk to you guys today about provider compensation, and I've got a case study to present of a hospital that I have been working with um, diligently over the past the past year, and it's been a really interesting situation that they've had, but I think it's such a good example of what's going on right now with provider compensation, because I will say it's a topic that has been at the forefront of so many people's mind about what to do about their provider compensation given all the changes they've been having. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what the client situation has been. And really one of the key messages I want you guys to take from today is about how you engage the board in these kind of conversations. This is not just the CEO and the CFO's problem to deal with provider compensation. It's really, really important. Um, I think this case highlights the importance of the involvement of your board having them well-educated and what their role is here. And then we're going to talk to you a little bit about the compensation strategy process that we went through and so that you guys can understand what this looks like. So this is a hospital that I've worked with. We're going to call them Hospital Payday. Uh, and they reached out to me um, back in 2021 about 
we needed a, we need a compensation strategy. They had a new CEO that I had worked with at a previous organization. He had come in to this organization and he realized, you know what, our compensation doesn't really make sense to me. We there's not any uniformity to it. I can't understand why one provider is paid this way and another is provide another way. There's not really some there's nothing strategic behind it, and it doesn't really align with our organizational objectives. And so, can you come in and help us develop a true compensation? strategy and model so that I can have some consistency with how we work with providers. I can have some guidance when it comes to recruiting providers as to what I should offer. I've got a PSA right now with some CRNAs, and I think it would really make sense to bring them in-house. So how should I go about employing a new provider group that I've never had before from an employment model? I want to make sure that I can fairly and be, I want to be competitive. It's really a hard market out there right now. It needs to be fair but we're struggling as an organization. So we need to be able to have something that's financially sustainable and it balances our organizational needs. Um, he had some really top, um, some high performers and you know, there's actually quite a bit of variability in the performance of a lot of him, his providers. And, but compensation, because it didn't have any strategy necessary behind it um, and they didn't have a compensation model, there wasn't any way to really incentivize those hard, high performers and reward them for doing well. And also incentivize those who, had potential ambitions around it, but you know there was no benefit to them for actually working harder or working smarter than they were also. Um, he wanted us to make sure we looked at their total remuneration package because they had a good benefits package they felt like, but they, one of the things that's been happening in the market is it's not just all about the W-2, it's not all about the cash compensation. We're hearing story after story about provider burnout and recognizing that there's significant benefits out there that have nothing to do with cash. It might be, you know, changes, operational changes as to the shift work that they're doing. It might be being able to go on sabbatical. It might be access to childcare at the hospital, certain different, different kinds of benefits that the providers need more than they actually need additional ca um, cash compensation. So can we explore that as a total remuneration package? They wanted to make sure that, you know, the providers were taken into consideration what their expectations and demands are. He had come from an organization that had had some shared governance and he was he had had a relationship of having very transparent um, conversations with his providers, his providers always having a seat at the table. And at this new organization, that wasn't their culture. The historical culture had been, well, the CEO just tells us what to do, like, like that's what it's going to be. And that's what we do. There was not really good engagement about the providers and they hadn't had a role. They never had a seat at the table before other than maybe a single provider who was on the board. And then also make sure that they follow best practices and compliance became an issue that we had to address during this because of how much compensation had just been individually driven and individually negotiated by a previous administrator. And then making sure that there was transparency and consistency. Providers need to know how they're gonna get paid. If, a, if you go into an organization, you ask a provider, you know, what really drives your compensation and how is it formed? And they say they don't know that is a very poor compensation model. A provider should very much keep in mind at the heart of it, compensation is what you pay people to do what you need them to do at an organization. So if they don't know how they're paid and they don't understand what drives their compensation, the chances are they don't necessarily know clearly what you need from them either. They might just be, well, I see patients. That's that's it. But they don't understand the relationship between the compensation that they're receiving and the, the responsibilities that they have. So as we started this, um, this project, as we went through, we did a bunch of data analysis. We saw that there had been no strategy. There was no consistency in methodology. Historically, what they did is basically a provider that they were recruiting came in and said, this is what I want. This is what's out in the market as far, you know, at the moment. And um, so go ahead and pay me that as a guaranteed base salary and, you know, I'll come to work for you. And that was really all they had done historically. So there was a lot. And every now and then, you know, pay equity had been important to them historically. So if somebody came in and asked for a higher compensation than what they were paying everybody else, they're like, oh, I guess that's the new market rate. Let's just change everybody in that department to that level of compensation. So you can imagine how that's not necessarily the most financially sustainable compensation model either. Also, with everybody being really different and unique and no methodology behind it, we had we encountered some really significant difficulties for coming up with a unifying strategy, right, of like what would make everybody feel like it was fair um, and how would this be financially sustainable and not have somebody feel like they were being cheated or personally targeted and cause some sort of mass exodus of providers. But as we were going through this, we realized, you know, with critical access hospitals, your board members are such an asset for you, but they can also be a liability. 
you know, your board members not are not necessarily healthcare people. It might be, you know, the person who owns the um, the supermarket, somebody who owns the car dealership, somebody else who's involved, you know, a city council person, not necessarily somebody who's in healthcare. But they have relationships with the providers. The providers might be going and having a beer after work, you know, with a with a board member. When providers have something that they're not happy about, they probably know a board member directly and personally to have a conversation about the fact that they're not happy about a situation. So when we recognized that we were going to have, we were starting to have some of these difficulties, and we knew we were going to have some some tough conversations in this compensation project we realized we really needed to engage the board beyond just letting them know, um, the CEO letting them know he, he needed this project to happen. The board needed some education. And you know when was the right time to provide that education? Where is it compared to when we talked to the providers? And really, what should the board do about it? So part of it was educating both the providers and the board as to what's going on in compensation right now. Um, because it's a heavily regulated industry, but so much has happened over the past three years. The pandemic has created burnout. It has caused issues with provider supply and demand with a mass exodus of providers saying, hey, we're retiring early um, and that creating some issues. So with that's the point, but we've also had big changes on the compensation side of things because of the physician fee schedule changes. In 2021, CMS did a massive overhaul to work RVUs, and we saw primary care providers, their work RVU calculations go up 26%. You know, we're used to a 2 3% increase potentially on work RVUs. But in primary care, as a recognition of not having increases for, frankly, seven years, CMS did a major overnight haul and you saw primary care providers work RVUs go up 26% to recognize the amount of documentation and efforts that they were making to start doing care management and moving towards population health. On top of that, we saw so many organizations in the pandemic rely on surveys of, oh my goodness, I just, I can't afford to lose anybody. Let's just increase everybody to the 75th percentile or keep people whole because we were getting CARES Act funding. And it, compensation started to get more and more di di um, divorced from what was necessarily the services being provided because we we didn't know what our services were going to look like during the pandemic. And so, but on top of that, organizations started to struggle financially once they went through, once they burned through their CARES funding, we had a significant scarcity of resources. And that scar scarcity of resources wasn't just um, the the money that's in the bank to pay these providers, but also our administrative staff, the people who are processing payroll, the people who could understand. So when you have high variability of what your contract say to pay their providers and your person, I worked with an organization that the person who ran their compensation model, they had so many different levers to pull. That person left and nobody else had knew how to calculate compensation and payroll for the whole next six months was such a complete mess because they had made it overly complex and nobody else knew how the providers were actually getting paid. So we see these different factors going up that, you know, that can drive compensation up. Some of them are driving compensation down, lots of changes and you have people coming into the board saying, well, I need to recruit. So since I need to recruit, you just need to like write me a blank check to do what I need to do to be able to recruit. And that can cause some significant problems. So we had to educate the board and the providers as to what was going on in compensation how the models were changing and what was impacting it. On top of that, the board should always, no matter what's going on in the market, long before COVID-19, provider remuneration expense is one of, is probably the highest in the number on your PL next to revenue. It's your, it's your biggest expense. For a board to not know what is behind and understand all the factors that are impacting that largest expense is a problem. If you want a board that is engaged in the financials, you want an organ, um, a board that knows, okay, what are the factors that are that are impacting this up or down? Because, you know, a swing in compensation, like with the physician fee schedule, if you were going to have all of your primary care go up 26% because maybe they were paid on productivity and on paid on a per work RVU basis, most organizations couldn't afford that increase in provider compensation. And so what are you going to do about it? On top of that, market data is increasingly available to providers, but unfortunately, it's incomplete market data. People... Providers are sharing MGMA data with each other, or AMGA. There's lots of national surveys out there that have information, but they're also calling up, hey, I know there's a provider who works four hours away, and this is what they got offered. Why is that not being offered here? And so organizations will adjust compensation because they're trying to be competitive without understanding the full scope of what 
is behind those numbers, not realizing that sometimes they're comparing apples to armchairs. It's not even an apples to oranges comparison. It might be what's in what's captured in the data that is there has what are the shifts associated with or what are the hours? What are the patient flow expectations? Are you in a critical access hospital that's working the ED all by yourself and you have no access to additional help? You're the one seeing all of the patients. You have no specialists that are on call for consults, et cetera, um, which means you might also be doing a lot of transfers out. Or are you working at a you know academic medical center where you also have researchers and you have access you might have a very large amount of volume, but a certain amount of compensation is tied to research and teaching, et cetera. Because what the, a lot of these surveys do is they report total compensation. So it might say that a primary care provider is getting $240,000 a year, but nothing is saying how much of that is for direct patient care, how much of that might be for medical directorship. Maybe they're a CMO. One of the things that impacts it significantly that I've seen is like a sign-on bonus that's all paid in one year, but is meant to cover a five-year term. So with this market data that's out there and available to providers, the boards need to know what's behind that. So when a provider comes to them and say, well, well, here's the MGMA printout. This is what I should be making. Look at these numbers. The board can be educated enough to say, well, let's talk about the full scope of the services that are being provided and how does our strategy fit in with that, right? It's also a very heavily regulated industry. And so it's really important for your boards to know the rules. You have a lot of board turnover. They have two, three year terms. You have new people coming in and off the board at a different time. You have to have regular um, education with regards to the rules that, that impact compensation, and especially to understand how you know so many of these rules that impact compensation can hit both the organization and the provider. And a lot of providers don't know that, that they're just as liable as the hospital themselves and who's doing that. You also need to know as a board, what are the different operational ch challenges that can be faced with some of these compensation matters, right? If compensation changes, how does this impact operations? Do we need to shift scheduling? You know, what are we trying to achieve here? Because again, if compensation is what you pay people to do what you want them to do, then you need to understand, okay, how are they going to do that? Are they given the resources to be able to achieve those different pieces? So in this case, we had to do a lot of board education about the legal piece they hadn't had the education about the rules that we're implying. And the biggest one is we really need to educate them about the Stark Law because under underneath the Stark Law, it's a civil, it's a civil um, law where basically, and it's strict liability. So if they say anytime you have any sort of financial relationship with somebody who can make a referral for a DISH service, so including like inpatient admissions, there's several different designated health services. It's a really, really broad rule that covers pretty much anything a provider can do. If you have a financial relationship with them, then note that's considered a violation of the Stark Law, unless fair market, unless you're paying within fair market value. And so it's really important to think about fair market value because when you're not paying within fair market value that is specific for your organization, you can have under strict liability a violation. It's a technical violation. It doesn't matter if you meant it, right? And so this is where sometimes um, you know, the payroll person leaving could create and not knowing how to pay properly in accordance to your contract can cause a violation that our critical access hospitals can't afford. I mean, these, you know, it ends up being a violation of the False Claims Act, which has triple damages. So a $100,000 violation becomes a $300,000 violation. We can't afford that as a critical access hospital. We don't have that cushion. So um, unless you're one of the very, very successful organizations that Eric has worked with on the abundance mindset and has a 15% margin, but I still don't recommend putting yourself in a position where you have to pay penalties. So what is fair market valuation? and How did we deal with this in this compensation strategy engagement? Fair market value, it's not just what survey says, right? It's not a matter of, hey, let's just pay MGMA median. There's lots of different factors that come into it. And some of that's already reflected in the survey, such as your specialty or subspecialty. A lot of the surveys have the data for, here's what a general surgeon makes here in the United States. But as I said, that's total cash compensation. It doesn't reflect all of the different, you have no idea how much of that is medical directorship, how much of it is APP supervision, how much of that is all these different factors. So fair market value also, you need to look at what are the duties and responsibilities that you have for those different providers. Are you, do you not have a hospitalist program? So your primary care is actually doing rounding at the hospital, then going to clinic and then rounding before they leave to go home um, in the evening, right? That's a very different primary care model than somebody who is 100% clinic based. Those are different duties and responsibilities that you need to, okay, so how do we compensate? So, you know, if they're bringing you data 
about, hey, I know this person works at this hospital, you know, hospital two hours away, and this is what they're making. Make sure, okay, are the duties and the responsibilities the same? What is the overall community need? So you can pay more if you end up having wait times to be able to get into the clinic of a three month wait time for a new patient versus somebody else that has a one week, you can pay more for that, right? To bring that provider in because you have inappropriate wait times and you have, you're have you having people not being able to get in and get the care that they need. One thing that came up in this project that was community benefit of really, a lot of people look at fair market value on the back end, but we looked at it on the front end because we asked the organization and the providers what are things that you value in you as an organization? What is your mission and values and things that it's worth paying somebody more because they're aligned with our mission and our values and we as an organization work? So for example, under community benefit is very well documented in fair market value that provider turnover is lower when they are a part of the community. So if somebody comes in and lives in your community, they are less likely to live leave than if they're commuting from two hours away. And so there's something to be said in this, in this specific um, engagement, we talked about actually doing an increase in compensation for anybody who is willing to live here. And it wasn't just a stipend of, okay, here's your relocation bonus. It was an actual increase to base compensation if you were willing to relocate for a minimum. Um, and once you had been here for two years, you got an automatic increase in your base compensation because we knew that it was, we, it was gonna reduce our turnover. Another thing that's a significant community benefit is somebody who has rural experience. If you've worked in a rural organization for be historically, you are less likely to leave because you already understand what does it look like to work in rural. You understand what the demands of the job are. You understand um, that you might not have access to some of these specialists and you enjoy what rural care looks like. It's not going to be a surprise for you versus if you're going to recruit somebody who's from a large academic medical center, just came out of residency with no rural experience that was trained in a way where they had access to things you don't have in rural, they're more likely to only last a year or two. And so do you have an increase in compensation for somebody if they, they're coming in where they've worked in a rural setting for five years? So those were a couple of things that we looked at in this engagement. There's other things that you can take into consideration, such as what is that compensation methodology and amount? So again, this is benefits versus cash. You know, cash isn't always king from a compensation standpoint. Some organizations during COVID started giving um, providers free access to the cafeteria. You know, lunch is included, no matter, you know, it's not a stipend that you get. You can just get food from the cafeteria anytime that it's open. That made it easy for organization, uh, for them. This organization, the providers loved it. They're like, okay, COVID's over, but we still want to be able to have access to this. This is awesome. Don't care what it's not. And we'll, yeah, we're not going to just to have the ease of not having to think about, hey, what am I doing for lunch every day? That was something that the providers really valued. So it's a different kind of compensation that's not necessarily a W-2. And a lot of times it, for the hospital, it made sense. And it was actually less expensive than trying to think about, okay, how much should the stipend be that I give every pr provider? One of the big things though on fair market value is it does have to have, your compensation should have a relationship to the services provided. So that includes if you are shift-based medicine, right? If you're a hospitalist, an ED, how long are those shifts? Are you on, on your own during that shift? Are there three providers? How many patients are coming in? We don't wanna incentivize emergency medicine providers to go out and hit people with their car to drive up ED volumes, right? We don't want that. So there's a certain amount of coverage that just needs to be ha happening and we have to be able to compensate for that. But what do those shifts look like? At this hospital, the providers really wanted to, to be able to have, hey, I'm on for 24 hours and I'm off for th you know the next three days. So I'd rather do fewer shifts that are 24 hours long and push through rather than doing 12 hour shifts multiple times a week. And so knowing that that was important to them, I'm like, all right, how do we do that from an operational standpoint in a staffing model where that works, that you can have the appropriate amount of care during peak times and have enough backup, but also be able to have, this is what your shifts look like. So you have to look at in that totality. I wanna to talk a little bit about the compensation strategy process. So when we do compensation strategy as an organization, um, I set this flow chart up to, because I think sometimes people think compensation strategy is like, just tell me what best practices is and we will implement that in the next 30 days. It's not really a good way to look at it. Compensation strategy, there's a lot of things that you can do on the back end that you can do 
relatively quickly. We get the data, we review and analyze it. We do some education. We select a provider compensation committee so that the providers can be really engaged as they were in this specific case that I'm talking about. They had not had shared governance. So developing a provider compensation committee where providers were gonna say, okay, now you represent your group and you're representing their the whole interest and you're representing the organization as opposed to what is best for you as an individual. And you're gonna have a seat at this table to design what's important. You know, we had there was a lot of thought that went to who is the best people to be on this provider compensation committee. Then we had to do some education. We did interview um, stakeholder interviews to find out what are the things that are most important to you? What are the things about compensation that you like? What, what don't you like? What's not important? So all of this stuff that's in the small boxes can happen relatively quickly, you know, 45 days, get, you know, knock, knock this stuff out. But then there's a bigger part that, okay, now we're gonna co-create a strategy and a mo you know, model. We're gonna create a straw man of what is fair for the organization. And this becomes an iterative process. Right, you're working with the providers. You come up with ideas, and we outline it, and then they have to be able to give feedback. And it might some sections might take a lot of time because they give feedback. We make adjustments. Does that work? Does that pencil out financially? You know, what what kind of behavior could this incentivize that we didn't necessarily think about? And when you're going through this, these types of pieces can really get drawn out, and sometimes they're going to have to go on pause. Of oh my goodness. We had this departure of this, you know, of um, of a provider. We need to redo. In this case, we actually had to do a lot of operational changes. The organization had staffed significantly up during co the COVID pandemic. Fantastic, they were able to find providers, but then they kept everybody after the pandemic, and volumes had dropped precipitously. So it was important to recognize. Oh my goodness, we all have all these. This is an organization that had the luxury of a lot of providers, but not necessarily enough work for them to do, and hadn't thought about the growth strategy of how are we going to redeploy these providers into the areas that we need. So this ended up being a really iterative process and having to have the board educated along the way of everything that was going on, but also upfront before we presented the providers with certain possibilities, we needed the board to be educated so that the board could also give feedback and say, okay, does that work? And it does it align with our organizational strategy, mission, and values, and what we're trying to achieve in a way that, that works for us. And so we, we had to keep the board involved throughout in a way that if you're just making tweaks to your compensation strategy, as opposed to start doing a complete overhaul or starting from scratch is you know, more difficult to do. And making sure that then once we, we got through and we developed the compensation strategy, the board actually had to pass it, take action on it, and involve, make sure it aligned with everything from um, med exec and their medical staff bylaws, and then had to go into implementation. So it was important for us that I am one of those people, you never go and say, okay, the board passed this last night, here's your new compensation, and put a contract in front of a provider to sign. We had to come up with a transition plan recognizing that you, you know this is people's livelihoods they need to be able to have time again to change behaviors because we're paying them for what we want them to do so educating them about what we want them to do giving them time to make those behavioral adjustments before it significantly hits their compensation so we had to do a two-year transition plan um, the providers looked at what the buckets of compensation were for and how it aligned with their overall strategy and they decided that they wanted to utilize mgma survey data they were going to use national data um, and then make increases for providers training and experience and, the, and commu certain community benefits. One of the big things about training and experience is we went back and forth about should we start out with national MGMA data or rural MGMA data? Well, recognizing that if you use national, it may be appropriate to make rural adjustments for, hey, their rural training or their rural experience. But if you use MGMA rural data, it's there's a lot fewer respondents but also you're duplicating those providers. There's an assumption that there's all, they're rural providers. They have rural training and experience. So we shouldn't, that would cause um, duplication. So we ended up using the national numbers and it was more appropriate for them to make the specific tweaks that they wanted to for training and rural. And they actually really um, uh, valued tenure in the organization. They wanted to make sure instead of just, hey, here's how much experience you have as a provider, here's how much, how much experience you have with us recognizing that a provider who's there for you know 15 years is less likely to leave and and has institutional knowledge and knows the community in a way that somebody who is brand new probably doesn't and how do we reward that we did have to make as i mentioned some significant operational changes 
And one of the important things is we had providers raising their hands and say, I want to be involved in this growth strategy. So how can I be involved in that? And how does that create a community benefit? So we had people outline specific growth strategies where they were going to dedicate portion of their time. And especially they're actually launching three new services that they had the resources for, they had the experience, but for some reason, they just weren't providing these services that their community needed. And this was a way for the providers to say, okay, I can stay whole in my compensation. And by launching new, this new program that I'm very interested in, over the next two years, I'm going to be able to grow that program in a way that my compensation under the new compensation strategy really feels comfortable for me because I can see how they are related to one another. But I'm, I have the courage to try this new, um, this new opportunity of growing this new service because it's not going to negatively impact my compensation, right? I can actually be kept whole for the new next two years while I'm trying to grow something new. New. And then we actually had um, we had an practice offer um, administrator who historically they didn't have a practice administrator, so they hired somebody who could be really involved with reporting the responsibilities with the providers engaging with them. And we had some providers really step up into new leadership positions in the organization, which was such a great thing to see. So it was it was a great great project to work on. It involved the board, involved providers, new governance for the providers and some significant compensation and operational changes, but really had that abundance mindset and a plan of like, let's get through this together as an organization and come out stronger. So it's been a really successful project. We're really proud of what they've been doing and they're applying that kind of mentality to now to their swing bed program and growing actually now surgical services as well. So really proud of that organization. So I know I'm at time, please. I do see that, um, let's see if there's something in the chat. Um, great. Um, to uh, conversation with Liz, Craker, and Eric that's going on in the chat set, um, function. But with that, I'm going to actually go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Claire Kelly, who is our next pres um, presenter today. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's give folks just a minute while we're adjusting who is presenting. I am going to rename Jeff. Thanks, Hillary. There we go. I realized that that most of you, when I said I was going to hand it over to Claire Kelly, you were probably expecting Claire Kelly instead of Claire Kelly, also known as Jeff Summer. Well, it's Claire and Jeff. Um, I am also here. <laughs> Uh, Claire, are you on? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to share your screen with the slides? Yes. Yep. Working Great. on it. Um, so thank you, Opal. Um, um, really have enjoyed the conversations today, both around abundance and also um, talking about what, what are some critical success factors for effectively uh, employing and getting getting the most of and building sustainable long-term relationships with your providers. What Claire and I want to focus on today is the topic around, around partnering and specifically what uh, Stroudwater has seen as kind of a chronic undervaluation um, uh, of rural affiliates by either prospective partners or existing partners. Um, and we think a lot of that, it really stems from uh, um, misunderstanding or imperfect information. Um, and so, um, again, our experience says that there is kind of a systemic um, undervaluing and, and a failure to optimize the operations. And by way of example, and we'll get into some of these examples a little later, but we've had a large, sophisticated uh, you know, billion dollar plus multi-billion dollar systems um, miss out on um, eight figures of annually of, of payments that they were otherwise would be able to uh, obtain via flawed rural designations and uh, alignments within the system overall. Um, so that uh, is, is something that, that certainly has happened and does happen. Um, we've also had the experience working with large systems where cost accountants undervalue incremental referrals from rural affiliates because they've assigned 
much too high a percentage of variable cost to each incremental referral. Remember, a larger system has significant fixed costs and standing capacity available. And yes, there is at some point some step cost involved, but certainly in the short term and certain, certainly on the margin, there's a relatively modest amount of variable cost there. Um, and, and one result of this is rural systems having too few and unattractive partnering options. So the result of this is that um, decision-making is made on flawed or incomplete data and opportunities are missed and um, suboptimal affiliation structures are employed. So we wanna spend a little time talking with you about how to, how to avoid some of those miscues. Um, why does this matter? Again, underinvestment, disinvestment in rural uh, operations results in uh, diminished access uh, to care. That's obviously not a good uh, outcome. Risk of, of greater leakage uh, of referrals uh, for the system that's underinvesting in its rural affiliates, failure to capitalize on opportunities. And again, we'll talk about this uh, more specifically later. Um, partnership terms not representing the value of rural affiliates or prospective rural affiliates, and um, the actual options um, themselves, who, who might be prospective partners, not reflecting the actual value that a rural affiliate could bring. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to walk us through some industry context just to kind of set the stage of what's going on in kind of the, the healthcare, healthcare industry and dynamics that are at play. So one of the first things we looked at are the three most prominent rating agencies. So Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, or S&P. So these rating agencies publish um, twice yearly outlooks. Um, specifically, they do a lot of different uh, sectors, but we're looking at the not-for-profit healthcare 2023 outlook that was published in December of 2022. And all three predicted you know, negative or deteriorating outlooks. Um, this is primarily driven through, through th three things, the first being labor shortages, the second being really supply chain disruptions, and you still have persistent COVID-19 surges. So the labor shortages, the supply chain disruptions are all increasing your expenses, but at the same time, you're not getting the revenue in the door. So that's compressing margins. And you're also not receiving the COVID-19 funding that was available in 2020 and 2021. We also want to look at what's driving this industry consolidation. What, what is causing, what are the catalysts for these affiliations that are taking place? So in this chart, you can see for the past 15 to 20 years from uh, 2005 to 2020, the escalation in the number of transactions that are occurring. Now, we could spend an hour or an, in, another webinar just going over all these catalysts for these affiliations, but due to time today, we're only going to hit on a few. And the first, again, margin pressures, where you're having expenses that are really outpacing revenue. Additionally, you have a staffing crisis. So not only are you having provider shortages, you know, your MDs, your nurse practitioners, your physician's assistants, you're also having your staff in crises of RNs, your front desk staff, your facility staff, et cetera. Those are all pressures that are causing transactions, as well as economies of skill. And what we mean by economies of skill is um, the education around rural. So finding folks that are really educated on the nuances of rural health care. There are a lot of regulations that are at play in rural health. Um, so having that expertise and that background for folks is also a really, really critical driver. talk about some of the regulatory scrutiny that's been going on the past few years. So we've been seeing a ramp up in the Federal Trade Commission or FTC looking at larger hospital transactions and acquisitions. So typically this is between a lot of larger systems. A couple examples are um, in Memphis, Tennessee, you had Methodist LeBonner that was backed to buy um, two tenant owned hospitals, but decided not to due to pushback from the FTC. In New Jersey, you had Hackensack Meridian Health and Inglewood Health that uh, backed out of a merger after the FTC challenged the deal. And in New Hampshire, you had Dartmouth Health want to affiliate with Granite One Health, which was a three hospital system, two of which were critical access hospitals. And the New Hampshire Attorney General objected to that proposed merger because it would violate the state's constitution for free and fair competition in the trades and industries. 
So again, for larger systems, you are seeing this, this increased scrutiny. It's rarer between critical access hospitals and larger systems that you're going to see that same scrutiny. But what it really gets at is the importance of knowing your value and having that value reflected in contractual terms with a partner and having that partner realize your value as well. And just make sure you've covered your bases. So if something does happen, you have the, the, the knowledge and the data to back up your decisions. Jeff, over to you. Great. So um, as we think about um, capturing a rural affiliate's value, it's important to think of this in two different lenses. One is for those uh, organizations that are in an existing um, relationship, sometimes those, those uh, relationships are sub-optimized. And um, what happens is, is leadership of the system isn't as well versed in all the nuances and opportunities that rural presents and may not be thinking of a rural strategy and how that might enhance the system. Um, for prospective partnerships, the same thing is true. And what's nice about a prospective partnership is you have a chance to level set that relationship and identify partners and vet partners based upon how um, willing they are and their ability to kind of understand and operationalize um, what that rural value proposition might be. For an existing partner who may not be taking advantage of all these uh, elements, um, there's you have hopefully a trusting relationship and the ability to communicate forthrightly with them, but it can be uh, more challenging to um, modify the status quo. But some of the levers available, certainly what we find oftentimes at system leadership level is they don't understand uh, cost-based payment and its implications operationally and certainly from a strategy perspective. Um, that is when you make an investment at a rural affiliate, um, a portion of the, of the um, interest payment and depreciation expense runs through, well, all of it runs through the cost report, but a portion of that will be reimbursed as a result of cost-based payment. Um, there certainly are in many instances cost report optimization opportunities. Um, and one of the biggies we see is the home office allocation uh, opportunity between a system parent and a critical access hospital. Um, this is one where we, we find some organizations are very adept at taking advantage of that opportunity. Others seem unwilling to do so, or um, are at the initial part of the conversation, unwilling to build that opportunity into what the strategy for the new affiliate or existing affiliate could be. Um, certainly access to 340B that's provided for all critical access hospitals is something worth um, exploring and, and uh, uh, operationalizing. Um, swing beds, again, a concept that if for many folks outside of the critical access uh, hospital environment are not as familiar with and prevents, presents some real opportunities to manage clinical care and in some instances decant volume or focus uh, in developing specialized programs at the critical access affiliate. Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities uh, is the value of attributed lives and uh, incremental referrals that a um, rural affiliate can bring. Uh, the way we often think of it is if you've got a critical access hospital that has an aligned primary care base and that organization is cash flow positive or even cash flow neutral, that is a unique opportunity. Um, nowhere else is a system partner, whether that's an existing partner or a prospective partner, gonna have an opportunity to create additional aligned primary care capacity uh, and attributed lives and have those additional lives uh, be essentially acquired, if you will, or aligned um, and have that be done with uh, on a cash flow neutral or positive basis. So. Um, really, really vital there. And we've touched on the value of incremental referrals and the true value. And again, it's important to understand that um, those incremental referrals, yes, they need to cover their variable cost 
anything above their direct variable cost is contribution margin to the system. And that's a big part of the value proposition. Um, another point worth noting, whether you're, you're in an existing relationship or maybe exploring partnership as an option that might enhance your ability to sustain your mission, is to understand that there is a full range of affiliation or partnering options. And these range on the left-hand side to looser or more tactical affiliations, maybe around a specific clinical service line where you can access additional expertise, members of your community can get access to care. Um, maybe there's a co-op model or a management agreement. These typically preserve uh, a decent level of autonomy um, and certainly um, the assets of the local health system remain uh, owned by the local uh, entity. Um, and it's important to note, one of the things I would note though, is you start to move to the right. Um, there's something that we refer to as the affiliation commitment curve. And what, what that speaks to is um, that the um, uh, commitment required, um, but also commitment expected from a partner increase. And so there's an opportunity to enhance the value uh, proposition of those uh, affiliations um, as, as you get that level of commitment. One of the things that's, that's an opportunity with a management agreement is you do still have the independent assets um, re that, that will exist after a management agreement. But one of the things we encourage folks to be aware of is that over time, a management agreement typically results in an atrophying um, and a hollowing out of the, the local affiliate as more and more uh, services are co-located or consolidated. And this is done for valid business reasons, don't get me wrong. But if your business office or IT support or HR support or compliance um, um, all now reside with a management um, uh, entity provided by a system, it's harder for you as an organization if for some reason in the future, you decided to switch uh, affiliations or partnerships or go back independent, there's a certain switching cost that exists there. As you move to the right, things become more aligned. Um, and I will just point out a joint operating agreements, um, I would be cautious around those. Um, they have some appeal and that you can really share and integrate operations while assets remain separate, but um, it's, a, it's an inherently unstable um, uh, affiliation long-term. Um, and I won't uh, dwell on the details. If, if folks want to um, get into that, Claire or I would be certainly happy to have a conversation around some of the experience we've had unwinding joint operating agreements uh, over the last decade. Um, as you move into joint ventures, sole member substitutions, and a sole member substitution is the most common affiliation uh, arrangement strictly between not-for-profit or organizations. Um, and holding companies, leases, and asset purchases, all more familiar. You often see asset purchases and leases um, being used by both not-for-profits uh, uh, partners and also for-profits uh, partners as well, but things become more aligned. What's important to understand um, from a critical access hospital or rural affiliate perspective is that any of these affiliations are an option. These, these structures are an option. Um, you really want to select the structure that's going to address your strategic objectives and frankly address some of the uh, organizational risks, the strategic risks that you, you face, and some of the constraints that you're facing. So you want to make sure you get the structure right. You want to make sure you get the partner right. And lastly, you want to make sure you get the terms right. What's also vital to know, as you see at the bottom of this chart, um, the swing bed opportunity in this case is available via virtually all of these affiliation structures. So this is a, you know, a, you could have a contractual or clinical arrangement that would have, enable a partner to take advantage of and uh, allow you to take advantage of maybe incremental referrals into your swing bed program. Uh, clinical and uh, logistical uh, constraints uh, notwithstanding, but as you get 
further to the right, you start to get more options in terms of that clinical or operational alignment. And um, the um, service line reassignments, service line um, uh, integration, and taking advantage of the 340B opportunity. If the partner organization, for instance, were not able to qualify for 340B, what might that look like? Those become options as you, you start to move to the right. But importantly, the home office allocation, which is oftentimes a significant one, and Claire will share some of that detail later, um, is something that really is reserved for the affiliation structures where the parent has operational control and risk um, associated with that, that structure. So um, those are, are important considerations. Again, I would emphasize there's a lot of variability and a lot of opportunity to customize these for the specific uh, opportunities and needs in mind. Uh, and there's a lot of variability, again, within each structure in terms of how those are shaped. This is, a, I think, a really compelling example uh, of an analysis we did on behalf of a client. This happens to look at North Carolina home office cost allocations for critical access hospitals in that state that were part of systems. And you can see, you know, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of variability in terms of the uh, cost overhead costs that were allocated uh, into the cost reports and um, of, of the critical access affiliates. Important to note that this is a gross amount. This is the cost actually allocated to the uh, cost report of the critical access affiliate. It would be further reduced based upon the proportion of um, cost-based payment that that organization was receiving. Um, you know, generally speaking, we see you know within five or ten percentage points of fifty percent um, in most cases as the proportion of cost-based payment. But that varies by system and excuse me by state in terms of um, whether Medicaid. Uh, pays on a cost-based basis, and also the, the specific payer mix and demographics of the organization. But you can see here, there's a very significant annual uh, benefit if you assume a 50% cost-based uh, portion of these uh, allowable costs being, being run through the, the cost report and being picked up as a result of having this rural affiliate. Certainly there may be some incremental costs that the system is incurring, by perhaps supporting IT or some, some other uh, functions. But in the vast majority of cases, um, the net amount of the home office allocation exceeds the direct incremental cost to the system. So a really uh, significant um, benefit um, potentially via critical access hospital affiliations. So really important to note, and Claire and I spend a lot of time talking about this, that um, critical that, that 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 affiliations or partnering is not a risk-free endeavor. There is inherent partner risk if you elect to partner. Now, it's also important to note that if you elect to remain independent, there's inherent operational or strategic risk associated with that. And the the real task for a board as fiduciaries of a critical access hospital is to understand how to balance and evaluate those risks. In this case, we're talking about partnering. Um, and again, there's certain techniques and strategies we use on behalf of our clients to try to mitigate these risks. For prospective partners, that is, the organization has previously been independent and it's evaluating affiliation and evaluating hey, no. partners, it's important to um, vet and select a strategically aligned partner. Uh, job one, you want to get the right partner. Job two is to make sure you have the right structure uh, and that that structure fits your objectives and constraints. And job three is really to make sure that you eliminate what we would term being non-lawyers as weasel words uh, and have contractually enforceable terms that reflect your value proposition and that are in fact enforceable. So I'll give you an example. We sometimes will see affiliation agreements that agree to invest up to 10 million or $20 million over five years. That effectively means that that a prospective partner could invest $0 
and still be in compliance with the agreement. So not a great term as structured. Um, and you really wanna make sure you have the right partner to, to strengthen or mitigate your risks. Um, lastly, looking at their, risk, at their track record and making sure that they have walked the talk is important. For existing partners, a little bit different uh, approach. First of all, you wanna make sure that um, you are able to communicate and articulate your value proposition to the partner. And understanding what their, their constraints are and what their concerns are is really important to that. Um, you wanna make sure you have the right structure. Claire and I have done some work on behalf of organizations that have had a partnership in place, but for one reason or another have kept the same partner but sought to um, find a different structure uh, to better meet their needs going forward. Um, you want to identify and quantify missed opportunities. And we'll talk about um, some, some specific techniques uh, a little bit later. But um, you want to quantify, if at all possible, and make a compelling case for the return on investment, ROI, um, of, of uh, any of, of the rural value proposition components. So really a lot of unique um, tools and approaches that can be used here. And I'm gonna quickly talk about some examples from the field that we've seen knowing that we have a limited time left in our presentation today. So one of the clients that Jeff and I had the pleasure of working with was a critical access hospital and they were in negotiations with a larger multi-state health system. And they had an offer from that larger multi-state health system, who, by the way, is very respected, um, knowledgeable, highly, you know, a credible, credible organization. And that offer really was of minimal capital investment. It really didn't have any role for the critical access hospital in local governance. It, it wasn't the offer that the critical access hospital had wanted. When Stratwater came in, we realized that the larger multi-state health system was only placing about 100K incremental value on the home office cost allocation. Stroudwater's calculations actually marked that estimated home office cost allocation to be around 3 million. So they were severely underestimating how much money was there on an annual basis. Additionally, they weren't factoring in 50% um, share of the cost-based payment or greater than 50% share of the cost-based payment, as well as the benefits of modest referral changes, meaning a, you know, when you add a new hospital to your organization, you're going to have some change in referrals and some change in patterns of where patients are going, and that will have a significant um, impact on revenue as well. So when all of these were brought to the attention of the larger multi-state health system, they actually revised their offer. They went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we're going to include some major capital commitments, we're going to include some major service commitments, and we're going to give you a, an enhanced role in, in local governance as well. So it really changed the entire negotiation for that critical access hospital. Another example that we can point to was Stradwater was retained by both a critical access hospital and a larger regional referral center. And these two organizations really wanted to focus on if they would be a, a strategic fit in terms of partnership. And the areas that they wanted to look at were a couple key um, service lines <clears throat> and clinical opportunities, swing band program opportunities, 340B program opportunities, opportunities with their rural health center or RHC, and of course the home office cost allocation opportunity. So these again are some of the value drivers that Jeff talked about. They don't even get into the, the nitty gritty minute detail that you can get from other operations with the partner, but from a high level, we were able to benchmark these on an independent basis between the two organizations, a limited partnership. So something towards the left of that spectrum that Jeff was uh, speaking about earlier and a full affiliation. So that's something on towards the right of that spectrum that would be you know, a sole member substitution, full asset merger. So in terms of service line reassignments where, you know, there's volume from that regional referral center that could be done at the critical access hospital, that was about a 1.1 million annual pickup um, from a limited partnership to a full affiliation. For swing bed program growth on an independent, it would be about 140K to 180K of a full affiliation for annual pickup. RHC or 340 Big B drug pricing program would be about 
270K for a full affiliation because you need a full affiliation to be able to pick up that 340B drug pricing program um, benefit. And finally, the net impact of a home office cost allegation allocation, again, needing more towards the right end of that spectrum of full affiliation was about 2 million annually. So across the three the three areas, you can see an independent is about 140K annual pickup from a partnership to a full affiliation of about 3.6 million. So it made a, a very big difference for those organizations when, when discussing their potential partnership. And I'll let Jeff close out. Great. Thank you, Claire. Um, we, we were going to We've got a few minutes left and um, want to really zero in on if you've got an existing partnership and you feel that the um, value you're bringing isn't being reflected, how do you engage with that partner? And our advice would be, uh, you know, first of all, focus on some early wins, you know, start small, build credibility. Um, and so how do you start prioritizing those opportunities? Well, things that have low barriers or costs to implement and quick ROI, time for payback, obviously are more attractive to anybody uh, in terms of investment. Things that don't require uh, a lot of additional investment time expertise to execute. Um, things that, that provide value, not just to you, but to the partner, and that also are strategically aligned. Um, really important. Um, engaging with the partner around some of using some of those constructs likely will be helpful. Um, and again, if you can start small and have some early wins, people will be more receptive as you move along. And there, as we've articulated, there are a lot of value levers here. With prospective new partners, it really strikes down, focuses on three things, having the right partner, a strategically aligned partner that has the capability and capacity and track record to do what they need to do uh, on your community's behalf. Two, making sure you have the right structure that best addresses your constraints and your objectives. Uh, we've seen where folks have gotten that wrong and it's it gets messy. Uh, and then thirdly, making sure that um, you have terms that are contractually enforceable. One of the things I would just note when we talk about uh, making sure you have the right partner is you want them to understand and value what you bring to the table, that they get the rural value proposition. That's really important. So just briefly, key takeaways. Um, folks often miss the intrinsic value um, and opportunity that a rural affiliate uh, uh, brings. And one of the foundational things um, to, to try to, I think, uh, engage folks around is the value of those incremental referrals. And um, perhaps one of the, the tools or techniques that can be used to highlight that is how your service area compares in terms of referral volume versus a comparable uh, market that isn't, uh, doesn't have an aligned uh, affiliate with the system. And that becomes a great compare and contrast. Um, know your value, do your homework. And really um, making sure that you have your operations in a positive trajectory, even if maybe there's negative cash flow, it's moving in the right direction and you have a plan you're operationalizing. That's incredibly important. Um, they wanna have, have confidence in the local management team. Um, and again, you, you've got to um, focus on that long-term sustainable win-win. You don't wanna, um, have it be a one-way street. There needs to be value in both directions. And I, I will say persistence pays off. We've found that it's a struggle at times to get people to understand these concepts. If they don't live in rural and they don't know cost-based reimbursement, it's a real challenge. Um, we don't unfortunately have time for questions today. Um, here's our contact information. If you do have a question, please feel free to reach out and email us. Um, we will provide the question and the response as part of our sharing the slides and audio from today's session. Wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Claire, for co-presenting. And I want to introduce Brian Hoppla, uh, our colleague who is president of Stradwater Capital Partners. And Brian has been doing some really um, great work uh, helping rural health systems access the capital they need to 
finance um, their strategic uh, initiatives. So, uh, Brian, uh, with that, um, I'm sure folks are eager to hear what you have to say. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And for the next 30 minutes, to Jeff's point uh, in the introduction, I'd really like to make sure that we spend this time giving everybody on the call today some real practical tools that you can use to assess your readiness to take on a capital project. Um, I've been really grateful that in the last 25 plus years, I have worked on about $1.5 billion worth of capital projects and frankly, just feel compelled to share those best practices with the industry because it can be a very complex process. And in fact, what we have seen, what I've seen in this past 25 years, most frequently is this idea of getting stuck at stop or running into stop regularly. So we want to make sure that we can help you get past stop and assess those best practices for uh, being able to organize the capital project and make sure that there is a source of committed financing behind what you're intending to do. Um, most hospitals that we've worked with, most community organizations, clinics, et cetera, have been through multiple planning projects and you know, for whatever reason or another, just kind of everything came to a stop. The most common reason of those was though, we kind of put all of our ideas together on a piece of paper, people get excited in the organization. And then we realized that we planned something that was beyond our capacity to execute from a financing perspective, a project that was sustainable. So we wanna make sure that we spend a lot of our time uh, working with you and your organization, and uh, as Jeff was referencing, creating Strudwater Capital Partners so that you have a partner with you, literally, to guide you through this process and make sure that our success is aligned with your success. So we um, structure uh, the financial arrangement to be contingent upon making sure that we get financing in place for your organization with the guidance that we provide you. So uh, in order to be able to execute on that, we need to make sure that we had a reliable uh, approach for uh, pursuing this project that's really based on best practices. And we use this analogy of climbing a financing mountain and each of the key steps and milestones in that process really is uh, how the best practice comes together. Now, we don't have time in 30 minutes to go through all seven of these steps. Uh, that's a much longer presentation, and I'm very happy to answer questions up mountains, as, as the case may be, around what some of these areas are. Um, but I'm going to focus most of my time this afternoon on the idea of base camp. So I'm not a mountaineer, but folks who climb mountains will talk about often how important it is to be prepared, and how everybody really comes together at base camp and becomes a team before going up the mountain. And so it was a powerful analogy in many ways because that is what we also wanna make sure that we do is that you and your community, all the stakeholders, uh, internal, external are prepared. And then recognizing that there's expertise that needs to come in from outside the community to help navigate uh, the complexity and the challenges of securing financing for a capital project. Who are those folks and how do we find them? What types of expertise do they need to bring to the table? Um, I'll be addressing that today as part of our base camp. And then the third area is really, how do we really assess the plan of finance and get to this point of what is sustainable and what is affordable? And before the end of my comments today, I really intend to leave you with some practical tools about how to evaluate your own financial performance and connect that to what you can do from a long-term capital project and a sustainable capital project. So that really is the first question that we often get is, where do we begin? And um, I would say that the most important thing is taking a look at what you're trying to achieve and making sure that there is a very solid basis of information, evidence in support of that being a clear need in the community. And uh, that is information that is, you know, can be related to health equity challenges in your community. 
It can also be, and very much needs to be, uh, you know, consistent with where the industry is heading so that you are putting your infrastructure resources in alignment to your strategic plan and the mission of your organization over the long term. And we have that uh, foundation again to, to move forward with from there. Um, we then need to start to get practical. Uh, again, having these intentions is really powerful. And many of us have been through the process of doing some of that dreaming and what if, you know, if we had these spaces, we could offer these new services, um, whatever that happens to be for your community. But then um, it's nice to have the dream, but where do we go from there? So the next step that we would very much recommend is creating that very clear checklist of what's our plan? What resources do we need along the way? How do we make sure that we're communicating the plan, keeping people on the same page? Uh, with one another. Um, so we'll have some thoughts in our presentation today about how to do that. And then finally, as I've referenced, we have a broader team structure that we need to pull together to support the journey um, up to the top of this financing mountain. Um, so the analogy of climbing that financing mountain. So we start again with base camp and understanding um, from a readiness assessment particularly when we're thinking about USDA financing, which is the primary source of capital for most rural healthcare projects, particularly the community facilities program. Uh, there are some requirements to access those funds in terms of your organizational structure, um, need to be not-for-profit or quasi-governmental. Um, if you are in a relationship as Jeff and Claire were just referencing, um, from an affiliation perspective, the nature of that affiliation may change uh, the aspects, some aspects of the financing or the application for financing. So that's a really important consideration, you know, right as we're getting started on this journey. Uh, the location of the project itself is probably the most important determinant, uh, particularly for the types of loan funds that you have access to. In the direct loan program, if you're in a community, uh, you can access those funds if you're in a community of 20,000 people or fewer. Um, so that covers the majority of our critical access hospitals, but um, it is an important delineation. And the direct loan program rates are really below market rates and have a lot of uh, consideration in them uh, for longer repayment terms, for example. Uh, and that's a current rate of 3.75% for up to 40 years of repayment. So it's a great piece of finance um, if you're in a location that is consistent with that, that project. Um, now, for those communities that are over that, or if we have a outpatient center, for example, in a larger adjacent community as a critical access hospital that happens to be over 20,000 people, there is another component of the program called the guaranteed loan program and that can be those dollars can go into projects that are up to 50,000 people so we have some additional flexibility uh, if we are in communities that are larger than that um, in terms of project goals as I mentioned before we want to make sure that you, you want to make sure we all want to make sure that these that the project that they're executing is setting you up for future success uh, that we're putting money into the places where we both have need and um, and the community really clearly is looking for additional service. As a, an example of what not to do, uh, we did see a hospital that went through an exercise of setting their project goal up to try to maximize the flow through of the, the impact of their capital project on the cost report. So you know, they were trying to mitigate the risk by saying, if we have the majority of our project be in areas that are gonna flow through to our cost report, then we can somehow minimize our risk. And what they did in this instance was put a lot of money into their inpatient unit. And they built an amazingly uh, beautiful, large inpatient unit that went unused because as many of you on this call know, the volume, the need in our community has shifted from folks that need to be in, um, admitted in, on an inpatient basis regularly to mostly outpatient services. 
So they, they, they met their goal of optimizing the impact of the cost report and the flow through of the interest and depreciation expenses, but they missed on being able to enhance services in a way that helped them build their overall business in the community. So they invested a lot of capital that didn't get used in an appropriate way because the project goal was inconsistent with where the industry was heading. Seems like it makes sense in retrospect, I'm sure. But that being said, the last area on the um, list here is financial capacity. And that's much more than just being able to address this in one bullet point. So we will get into how you can think of that here in the next several slides. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to make sure that we're conveying to you and, and everyone else here is when we are getting ready to put a capital project together, we don't want to assume hope is being a strategy. We don't want to go out and have the architects and engineers having conversations with people in the organization, getting them all excited about what kinds of new spaces they need and how they could enhance their existing services with those types of investments and then not have the financial capacity and the wherewithal to be able to deliver on that. Seems like it makes sense. So we start by really understanding what is a conceptual debt capacity. I, I know it's kind of a consulting term, but it's, it really is conceptual. And what we're looking for here isn't the be all and end all answer. Um, up mountain, we're gonna have a full financial feasibility study where uh, you know, they're literally turning over every rock to make sure that the plan is so solid and sustainable. Right now, what we're talking about making sure that we start with is where, where have we been from a financial perspective, particularly over the last five years? Um, as Jeff was just referencing, Jeff and Claire in the affiliations discussion, looking at trends and seeing what the trajectory is, the trajectory that we're on, and using that information to be a starting point in our plan, and particularly looking at the cash flow associated with that. So let's look at our financial performance before the interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So a bit of financial performance, and over the five-year process is also in alignment with what the USDA will look at as part of the application process um, itself. Um, they're gonna wanna look at your prior five years of audited financial performance um, to make their own judgments as to which direction you're heading and how this project will, will enhance that, the project that you're planning. The second area for the critical access hospitals on the call is to really be able to add in that bump that you will get on the pass through of you know, what is often capital costs that you haven't had historically because your buildings are fully depreciated and you don't have a lot of long-term debt on your books and interest expense. Um, you know, so you have not gotten historically a lot of this flow through for the cost report, um, but it does make a difference. So if you're you know, somewhere in the 30 to 40% overall Medicare cost-based mix, we wanna make sure that we factor that in because it's effectively generating additional income based on this new expense that you're going to be incurring as it relates to taking out a loan and, and adding the capital assets and the depreciation. So with those two sources of capital, so to speak, or income, we really want to help look at this through the lender perspective. And the two things that they are going to be primarily interested in initially are the idea of debt service coverage ratio and your day's cash on hand. So today's cash on hand tends to be a lot more familiar to those of us um, in operations and management because it's something that we pay attention to regularly. Debt service coverage ratio, if you haven't been active in the financial markets, might not be as intuitive. And what that is really getting at is the relationship of these sources of income, your cash flow as a proxy, the relationship of that as the numerator in the conversation to the denominator of uh, what is the debt service that you're that you're taking on one of those annual payments that you need to make to the bank for whatever you've borrowed. And lenders want to look at the relationship of those or the coverage, you know, how much excess cash and cash flow are you able to generate over and above the amount that you're obligated to be paying for this long-term debt. And the USDA program has what the industry would consider to be pretty low thresholds at 1.1 to 1.25. 
because that's really saying that for every dollar of cash flow that you're going to be paying to a lender, a bank, or a credit union, that you're generating between a dime and a quarter of extra cash overall in your organization. And for those of you uh, CFOs on the call who just kind of you know got a little bit reclumped about that, it is a very thin margin. Uh, you know, you've if you're at a 1.1 time coverage ratio. It, most of your eggs are in the basket of the capital project. Um, we see a lot of projects that um, have been financed where they are you know, a two times coverage ratio. So for every dollar of debt service, there's an extra dollar of cushion for the organization's other routine capital needs and operating needs to be generated. Um, and most projects would probably fall somewhere in between those two. Um, and then the, that other category of days cash on hand, also very important, uh, talking about having all of our you know, eggs in one basket. And what we want to be able to see there is being able to maintain um, at least 40 to 50 days of cash on hand um, or greater. Uh, but again, depending on the lender, uh, they might want to see that greater, but USDA's thresholds tend to be a little bit lower. And we see 40 to 50 days as being a nice you know, settling point, so to speak. Now, once we have uh, this idea of you know, our debt capacity, what we can reasonably, sustainably take on relative to uh, how much you know, we've been able to generate financially internally, it's also important to look at some other sources of, of financing for the project, which are not us borrowing the money from somebody else. And those principally fall into the equity categories on the left-hand side of the screen here, which is you know, if we've got cash on hand that is over and above that 40 to 50 days that we want to put towards the project, um, we can add additional operating reserves um, that will help us borrow less money in the future. Um, some organizations set aside funding into a funded depreciation account on a regular basis. Uh, that's an important source uh, to look at from an equity perspective. And then the last one, that a lot of rural communities, frankly, um, overly diminish is the idea of fundraising. Um, so one of the very first critical access hospitals in the country was replaced in Del Norte, Colorado, a town of a couple thousand people. And they did not have a lot of liquidity at the time. This was in 2001 when they were doing this project. And they also didn't expect to be able to raise a lot of money from their community. So in their plan of finance, they conservatively said, you know, geez, what if we raise between $500,000 and a million dollars? Could we make it work with that? And they did all the numbers and they made that work from a planning perspective. Then they went out to their community. And as it turns out, people were really excited about this project. They saw the impact that the project was going to make. And they ended up raising $5 million towards that project over time. So I uh, understand fundraising can be really hard. We're not professional fundraisers on this call. And it's challenging to assess what's the right amount. But what I would offer is, uh, you know, you may end up being able to raise a lot more money than you expected because people in the community see the project, the impact that the project's going to make, and they get excited about that. So that's a great thing because anything that we do in being able to contribute uh, equity towards a project means that we don't have to go out and borrow money unnecessarily. That certainly is the goal. On the borrowing side, though, as I mentioned previously, under the USDA programs, there are these two different sources of debt, direct loans and guaranteed loans. They often work in combination with each other. And frankly, we one of our primary interests is making sure that projects are funded with as much of the direct loan funding as can be available in your area and in your state. And that's often negotiated with USDA as part of the application process and, and communicating with them your, your financial condition and helping them see the benefit of those dollars. So ultimately, we need to be able to find sources of funding in either debt or equity to be able to offset those uses of the funding. Um, but we're also not construction experts either. So this is the third component of being able to put together a conceptual budget that's really important. And that is this, 
being able to understand that when we do a project budget, if we total up what we can afford from a sustainable perspective in debt, and we add in our equity, and let's just say that we get to $30 million. Actually, let me help me myself with the math. Let's say we get to $40 million. Now that $40 million is your budget, but that's your total budget so that we need to be able to pay for things that aren't particularly construction. You know, we need to have equipment, uh, furniture fixtures, regular, you know, just general um, uh, pieces of furniture equipment in there. And what we find then is that really from a planning perspective, when you add your debt and your equity together, the best principle to follow, the best proxy is 75% of that amount is what you would have available for construction itself. So being able to communicate that very clearly with your architects or engineers and ultimately your broader project team to say, hey, we're in for $40 million in this example, um, but don't start planning for $40 million of construction because we have some other components of the project that we're gonna need to pay for as part of that total project budget. So if we use 75% in this instance, because I made my math easy for myself, we would have a $30 million construction budget in that particular project. And of note, $30 million sounds like a tremendous amount of money, but with construction inflation that we've seen, particularly over the last couple of years, uh, there's really been about a decade's worth of inflation just in the last two years of kind of typical inflation. So unfortunately, $30 million doesn't go as far as it used to. And in fact, we're seeing project costs be as high as $1,000 per square foot, depending on the particular type of project. So you start doing the math on that and you realize capital projects can get very expensive very fast, which brings me back to how can we make it even that much more predictable and reliable and ensure that what we're doing is sustainable, which kind of then brings me to we do that by working within a team and we want to make sure that everybody on the team here is on the same page, uh, that we don't have somebody working off of an assumption that we can afford anything and that they should you know, be planning for the moon, so to speak. We also don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot of, you know, of planning and not having a project that makes enough of an impact, um, doesn't provide the services that we're really looking to provide. So this project team uh, led by the CEO, CFO, um, really needs to be able to uh, pull those pieces together and make sure that we, that the project and the team is staying on the same page as we're going through uh, the rest of the financing process. And they're gonna need to look at, uh, particularly on the other side from the project team over here, the owner's representative is a great resource for them. This is. Typically, a, a firm or an individual who is familiar with construction within the healthcare industry, you know, is able to work with the architects, the engineers, ultimately downstream, the contractors, um, and, and others uh, that are executing the project, and making sure that all of that is being done within the industry best practices, and it's being done on budget and on time, and all of those types of resources. So they really take the baton after financing. Uh, is put in place and make sure the project is uh, executed well. Um, but before that, uh, we also have a lot of other folks. We have the financial feasibility consultant, um, as I referenced before, that makes sure that the conceptual debt capacity that we establish early on in the project for planning, that's a real debt capacity and that they examine all of the different uh, assumptions associated with the project and determine based on their professional opinion that those assumptions are reasonable and achievable by your project. Uh, so each, each one of these individuals and entities is playing a different role. Um, as was referenced in one of my early slides, uh, just because they're at the table doesn't necessarily mean that they're sharing information effectively with one another. So we find that it is also a very important best practice to create a system, an infrastructure, a project plan, where uh, each of these entities can see what everybody else is doing. And we do that in an online project management system called monday.com. 
Uh, it's a great system for you know, really identifying who is going to be doing what and by when so that there's accountability built in. It also functions uh, to help share that information so folks can upload their latest drafts and their documents for the rest of the project team to be able to see without relying upon a million emails flying back and forth and trying to keep things organized that way. So it provides a couple different types of functions, but it's also not sufficient in and of itself. So I would also encourage you as the best practice to have regular coordination calls. Uh, we have calls on a weekly basis through the planning process to make sure folks are on the same page. Um, they're scheduled for an hour, but they rarely go for the full hour. So, you know, folks can come on and share the information that's needed. And then if we're done early, then we get done early. Um, but it is a really important touch point. Uh, to the point of recognizing, you know, that we have a number of steps to continue to navigate through the process. Um, steps two through five actually coordinate to the four application requirements in a typical USDA loan. Uh, the first number two, where community investment is planned to the community's needs, is in a document called a preliminary architectural report or affectionately known as the PAR. Um, that is a key document that gets created very early on, as you can see. Uh, the second requirement or step number three in our model here is uh, doing the environmental study that USDA requires. Uh, they have very rigorous environmental requirements, particularly around wetlands um, that are important to consider early on in the project, really as, or as soon as you can after having a site plan for what you're looking to create um, to make sure that it can fit on the site that you're looking at. Then uh, we go on to that financial feasibility study and have that business plan really be closely examined by an independent um, accounting firm that issues its own report and opinion on uh, the achievability of the plan and the projections. Then step number five, or the fourth requirement, as the case may be, is an appraisal. And the appraisal is, again, another independent party coming in to look at the project and saying, the value that's getting created by this project is in excess of the amount of money that's being borrowed uh, to, to execute the project. That's a, called the loan to value calculation from a lender perspective. And that's a USDA regulation requirement. And then once we pass through stage number five and we've got the project plan, we've got the environmental, we've got the financial feasibility and the appraisal in hand, of course, we put all of that into an application process, create some conversation, additional conversation with USDA to help them see what you're what you're working on and what you're doing and and see how the pieces are connected and then um, get get that submitted to the to the agency so again lots at the very end of where the rest of the process goes but um, for today's purpose i would just invite uh, if we do have any additional questions or i know we're right at the very end of our time here um, so hillary i'm not sure if you have any final things that you'd like to say for the for the folks on the call today, or um, if we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, that was a great presentation. And if anyone, um, if anyone has questions for Brian but um, didn't get a chance to um, to ask them today during the presentation, you can uh, feel free to contact him or any of our team uh, through email mm -hmm. or phone. It's on um, our website and. Um, just wanted to let you know that there a survey will pop up when you exit the webinar. Um, and um, we really value your feedback. It's very important to us. We're very committed to presenting uh, really high quality educational events. And um, if you have the time, please take a minute to let us know what you thought of the presentation today and any possible way that we can improve. All right, thank you very much everyone for attending Thanks, and everybody. everyone who presented. Thank you.